Welcome to the second half of the CNC router tutorial, where I'll be showing you how to set up the machine to run a job. Uh, I'll be assuming that you've seen part one of my tutorial, where I go over using vCarve and generating toolpaths from there. This tutorial pertains to two machines. The first one is pictured here. It's a four foot by four foot router. It's the machine we've had the longest and is therefore most people's default option. This is our newer machine. It's 60 by 90 centimeters, which is roughly 2 by 3 feet in working area. It's smaller than the other one, but is built with higher quality components, so should be able to get better results, but as of the filming of this video is still a little new to us, so its strengths and weaknesses are still a little underexplored. Okay, well the first thing we're going to want to do is turn the machine on. On the big machine, that is done with this rotating switch that's labeled right here. The smaller machine has two power switches. The one on the right turns on the spindle and the one on the left powers up everything else. Another important part of setting up the machine is fixturing the part to be machined. Here you can see the clamping system used for the smaller machine. The table has these T-tracks in there and the clamps will slide into those T-tracks and allow you to clamp a part down to them wherever you like. The large router has a simpler, if somewhat less elegant, system. Here, the table is made out of a sacrificial piece of MDF, and so you will simply screw your part down to it. While clamps and screws, respectively, may be the default choices for these CNC machines, there is a whole world of alternative fixturing methods you may want to think about for complex or repeated jobs. Things like glues or vacuums uh, or custom machine fixtures to hold down parts you want to make multiple copies of. One last step of machine setup is installing the right tool you want to be using. And that's usually going to start by removing the tool that happens to already be in there. And so you can see here, this is what the thing is going to look like you're going to need to get one wrench onto the spindle of the motor up above and then another wrench onto the nut that's clamping the bit in place down below. So here's what the whole system looks like. On the left, of course, is the tool. On the right is the ER collet that is clamping the tool into place. And then in the middle is the nut that locks everything together. Both machines use the same ER collet system, although the smaller machine uses slightly smaller ER collets. It should be pretty obvious which ones will fit and which ones will not. Now there's a couple of things to be on the lookout when you're setting up a new tool. First off, it's very important that you use the right collet for the tool that you've got in mind. This can be especially confusing between metric and imperial collets that will look very, very similar, but are slightly different and may not be compatible. Probably the worst offender here is the six millimeter versus quarter inch collets that look very, very similar and differ only by a quarter of a millimeter. My advice is to keep aware of what you're doing. It should not require a huge amount of force to stuff a cutter into a collet. That's a sign that you're trying to use one that's too small. And when you've got everything assembled, the bit should stay in place just with the friction in the collet from the spring force. Uh, if it just falls out on its own, your collet may be too big. It's also important to get the order of operations right. It's critical that you put the collet into the nut before you put the tool into the collet, or else the parts will not sit where they're supposed to be. If all goes well, you'll often hear a little bit of a click when it's snapping into place. Now all we have to do is screw that whole assembly back onto the spindle. Please make sure that the threads are all clean. A good indicator of that is that it should just screw on freely by hand until you bottom it out, where you'll need to grab the wrenches to give it a good tighten. You don't need to tighten it like crazy, but you do want it to be snug so the bit doesn't move around during the job. 
Now that we're done setting up the machine, it's time to switch over to using the computer, and we're going to get started by loading up Mach 4 by clicking this little button on the taskbar. Don't forget that you do need the machine to be on before you do so, or else Mach 4 will get angry. So do be sure to turn the, turn the machine on before you go ahead with this. This next window is asking you which CNC machine you're using, so make sure you click on the correct profile and hit OK. Now this is the main Mach 4 window. The first thing we're going to want to do is go down to the bottom left corner and click Enable because the machine will turn on by default with everything disabled as a safety feature. So if we want to be able to make things go, we'll have to do that first. The next step in the process is to tell the machine where in its working area to do the job. And that is done by defining the X, Y, and Z coordinates for the tool and making sure that those are in the proper place given where we defined them back in vCarve. This is usually done by manually moving or jogging the machine so that the tool is aligned to important features of our job. For most jobs, that means putting the tool in the bottom left corner with the tip of the tool just barely touching the top surface of the work. That is going to be x equals 0, y equals 0, z equals 0. To do this jog, we're going to have to go into the Jogging tab here. And now we can click on these buttons in order to move the machine in X, Y, or Z. Now right now, I have the machine in continuous mode, which means that as long as I'm holding down the button, the machine will move. This is very handy for making course adjustments very quickly, but is very inadequate for doing precise actions. Alternatively, you can put the machine into step mode by clicking on button jog mode here. This way, every time you click one of the buttons, the machine will move by exactly a specific step here, one thousandth of an inch. And so this way you can make a very precise motion to do a more careful alignment. If you want to change the step size, you can click on the incremental jog step button here. Now for the most common workflow, where we're going to be cutting a piece out of a larger sheet of plywood, we don't have to care too much about precision alignment in X and Y. We just want to get the tool in continuous mode down to the front left corner, hit 0x and 0y to set the position accordingly. Being careful to realize that if you are cutting something out, you may go outside of zero, 00 and to be wary of any screws that you might be getting too close to here. Now while we can often be inaccurate in X and Y without issue, Z always needs to be precise. So to get that right, what we're going to do is drive the machine into the middle of the workpiece, put it into step mode, and slowly descend the tool while moving a piece of paper back and forth between the tool and the work until the paper just barely gets caught and that way we know we're very accurately at the surface of the wood. Now we can click Z0 and we are done with the position calibration. Next we're going to want to load up our G-code by going into File Ops and clicking Load G-code. With your G-code loaded, you should see something like this. On the left, you'll see a preview of the G-code itself, and on the right, you'll see a graphical preview of what it thinks it's going to do. It's a great check to make sure that you're going to run what you think you're going to run. At this point, if everything looks good, then we should be fine. After all, we have our material in place, we've got our tool loaded in, and we have our X, Y, and Z coordinates set as they ought to be. We are ready to click Cycle Start and get going. However, there are a couple last thoughts that I'd like to leave you with before you fire up the machine. First, I wanted to talk about the rate overrides. Now, when you were setting up the tool in vCarve, hopefully you used a speed and feed setting that is relatively sane for what you're trying to do but it's almost certainly not going to be ideal. So while the job is running, you can click on the feed rate override or spindle override 
in order to change those settings on the fly. If the machine is sounding bad, it is chattering or doing something like that, uh, don't hesitate to turn those rates down. But also don't necessarily discount that you may have to turn those rates up. Having too low of a feed rate can be just as problematic as having too high of a feed rate. Next, what happens if things go wrong? Now, while the machine's running, you can click on Feed Hold to pause the feeding of the machine without stopping anything else. Uh, this is great if you need to sweep something out of the way. Uh, and you can also click Stop if you need to stop the machine in a hurry. But these buttons are on the screen. They're a little bit tough to get at. And so all of the machines have a emergency stop that is a physical switch that you can carry around with you and should always be very close at hand if you need to stop the machine in a hurry if something has gone seriously wrong. If you do need to use the emergency stop, it's triggered by pressing the button and released by twisting the button to release the catch and allow it to go back up again. The last thing I wanted to mention was dust management. Here you can see the dust shoe that fits over the spindle on the large router. That way it can contain the dust that gets produced and suck it up into the vacuum hose that you can see on the left. The shoe is held on by magnets, so all you have to do is raise up the z-axis to put it on or take it off as needed to get access to the tool. However, it may not always work for every tool. Some tools may be too long, others may be too short. So you may have to run the machine without the dust shoe. If you do, please be especially careful about where the debris is going. The large router is especially susceptible to damage if the debris gets up into the rollers, where you can see here it's collected and will cause damage to the machine and less accurate behavior as it gets fouled up on all of that junk. All right, well, this is a good place to stop. Don't hesitate to jump in and give the CNC router a try, nor should you hesitate to ask for advice or input from some of the other folks who've been using the machine a little longer. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I can't wait to see what you'll do with these machines.